مرحبا حبيبي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to our first anniversary episode Jay, look at us who would have thought not me <laughs> alright as you can see I just went shopping at Home Depot you should do the same this one this this magnificent power well, I guess I would shoot the gun, not necessarily at somebody, but maybe shoot the gun and maybe, you know, run at the person and try to disarm them. Like, I don't know. I mean, these are the same people who are taking the lead in demanding that the Internet be censored, that ordinary citizens be censored on the grounds that they are ordinary citizens. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. What's going on, Habibis? I'm Siraj Hashmi. I'm Jack Kobe. And welcome to another episode of Habibi Power Hour Premium. Habibi Bros. Jay, how you doing, man? I am doing wonderful. Not too bad. How's your day? Good, been? Good man. You know, I'm I'm very excited, very excited for our guest tonight. Um a legendary journalist. We're going to bring him on in just a moment. Um, but before we do that, um, Jay, today, as of this recording, is our one year anniversary of doing a BB Power Hour. Could you believe it? Could, could, could you actually believe we make it one year of doing a BB Power Hour? Uh, no, I thought we were going to get canceled long before the one year. I, I thought it was probably going to be two months in. I'm like, with my record on Twitter and stuff and, and knowing how YouTube and, and all these other places are, I'm really surprised that we yeah. didn't even get a strike. We've only gotten uh, copyright strikes because of yeah. the vaccine song we've, obsession. We've gotten, we've gotten demonetized <laughs> because of how many times I played the vaccine song, but that's just been about it. Like we've been able to maintain uh, our our presence on YouTube and Patreon. We haven't been deplatformed yet. So Habibis, if you if you're tuning in, make sure you get you get in before we get canceled straight up. <laughs> Exactly right, because you know that's going to happen. The babies were welcomed by the legendary journalist and author of the new book, Securing Democracy, My Fight for Press Freedom and Justice in Bolsonaro's Brazil, Glenn Greenwald. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us, Habibi. Appreciate you joining us tonight. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I was uh, in a car on my way here to make sure to get here in time, and I heard on the radio... Um, in Brazil, that it's your one year anniversary. I don't know if that's true or not. So I just, in case it is, I did hear that on the news. I wanted to wish you guys a happy one year anniversary and say how thrilled I am to join you for that. Uh, well, we Thank never thought we would get you. someone like you on our show. And so we, it is a great honor for us. Um, and we will get into some of the the other things you're very passionate about, but we very, very much want to talk about uh, this, this book, Securing Democracy. Um, because obviously it unpacks a lot of your reporting that was done over the course of the last few years involving Operation Car Wash in Brazil. And you have been a resident of Brazil for the last, was it 15 plus years? What, 16 years now? Yeah, yeah, just going in 16 years. Yeah, so just setting the scene for us, for those who are unfamiliar, what is Operation Car Wash and how has that impacted Brazil over the, this, these last five, six years? Or even so, longer. It's, I would say it's the last decade since 2013, was it not? Yeah, it, it more or less started in 2014. Um, okay. And it was basically, it began in this very unglamorous way. Uh, it started in this midtown city called Curitiba, which most people outside of Brazil don't know and shouldn't know because it's a shitty town worth nothing. It's kind of like the Kansas City of Brazil. I think I like Kansas City, but you know, if you don't live in the U S <laughs> you won't be talking much about Kansas city. Right. And it started off as this like kind of just run of the mill money laundering uh, investigation where there was money laundering actually taking place through the local car wash, which is how the corruption probe ended up taking that name and the money launderer who they kind of closed in on when he was arrested and they had very conclusive evidence of his guilt said, Hey, you know what? Um, you guys got me. 
uh, I was money laundering, but uh, you shouldn't be interested in me. I can actually turn over evidence to you of the guilt of the most powerful politicians and the richest people in this country. And I'll be happy to do that in exchange for leniency. And obviously they were very skeptical at first, but the more they listened to him and kicked the tires on what he was telling them, the more it turned out to be true that he was actually the leading fixer for Brazil's billionaires and the state owned oil company Petrobras and all of the huge construction companies that get massive contracts in exchange for huge kickbacks. He knew where the Swiss bank accounts were of politicians and countless parties. And so this probe that was really this kind of, you know, trivial, uh, coincidental investigation turned into the most powerful force in Brazil because it started leading directly to the doorsteps of the most powerful people in the country. And the judge who was overseeing it, whose name is Sergio Moro, is this very young judge. He was, you know, at the time, 41 or 42 when it started, and he led this team of even younger prosecutors in their 30s. And the argument basically was, because Brazil has been running by systemic corruption for decades, that these this was the new generation of Brazil coming to clean up the country. They weren't born mm -hmm. into the military dictatorship that ruled the country until 1985. They were the first generation born into democracy and instilled with those values, took it seriously, took the constitution seriously. And they became these folk heroes, you know, these larger than life, almost religious figures um, yeah. where Brazilians stopped identifying with ideology or party and began identifying with them instead. And, you know, over the years, Moro grew bigger and bigger and bigger. By 2016, he was on the time 100 list, the only Brazilian that year. Uh, many years, I don't have any Brazilians, but the only Brazilian that year to be on the list. Um, and then it really reached its peak that year when it's, Leaking of various accusations led to the impeachment of the center left president, Dilma Rousseff, who was the successor to Lula, um, mm -hmm. who was, you know, one of the giants of the last 20th century. And then in 2017, they kind of got the big head on the pike that they had wanted all along, which was Lula himself, right as he was gearing up to run for president in 2018. All polls showed that he was leading all other candidates, would almost certainly win. They brought very dubious conviction charges against him. And Judge Morrow very quickly found him guilty, sentenced him to a decade in prison. And that caused Lula to be ineligible to run for the presidency, enabling Bolsonaro to just have an easy path to victory. And as soon as Bolsonaro won, he turned around and rewarded the judge who had removed his primary adversary, Lula, with the most powerful and important position in the country, which is Minister of Justice and Public Security, made it much more powerful than it had even ever been. And so that was kind of the conclusion of, of Operation Car Wash, that the judge who imprisoned Lula ended up joining the far right government that he helped enable. Yeah. So before I kick it over to Jay, I mean, can you t I mean, you mentioned this, this systemic corruption. How rampant is corruption in the culture of Brazil? Well, so it makes whatever corruption takes place in the United States look like, you know, penny anti jaywalking. Um, you know, most corruption in the United States is actually legalized. You know, you hire, you know, Chuck Schumer's legislative aide when he leaves and you pay him $500,000 a year or more. And all you're doing is paying for his ability to call Chuck Schumer and tinker with some, you know, provisions of legislation that nobody cares about or knows about, but that gives your company a massive tax break. So it's essentially mm -hmm. kickbacks, but it's all legalized. And occasionally there's like the real kinds of corruption, you know, like uh, what is that guy's uh, Duke Cunningham and mm -hmm. Duncan Hunter, mm -hmm. those kind of people like those weird California Republicans who got caught actually taking bribes. Yeah, Chris Collins. Yeah. In, yeah, exactly. Whereas, in, you know, or, or Bob Martinez, he was acquitted, but clearly guilty. Um, whereas in oh, Brazil, Bob Menendez, yeah, Bob Menendez, Bob Menendez yeah. yeah, everything is done by corruption. You know, um, everyone knows if you want a contract from the government, you pay members of Congress or ministers. They all have secret Swiss bank accounts. Um, you know, Brazilians assume that everybody who's on the ballot uh, is a criminal and they uh, pick the person who 
gives them the most. There's a phrase in in Portuguese that Brazilians use called he steals, but he he does, meaning, yeah, he steals, but he at least passes on some of it to us. <laughs> it's like, and, it's just like the know, Trump ad, as, at least he fights, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I remember watching this uh, video, this interview once of these coal miners in, Wisconsin, uh, in, in West Virginia after Trump had come to the state and said, I'm going to bring back your jobs. And they interviewed these guys and they were like, yeah, we know he's lying. He's not going to bring back our jobs, but at least he's pretending to care. Whereas Hillary came and she came and she's like, yeah, fuck your jobs. They're gone and they're never coming back. <laughs> so it's kind of a low bar that people have in the U.S. and Brazil for what they want from politicians. So, yeah, it's it, it's a you know, it's a really serious problem. Um, and, and that's why a lot of people across the political spectrum, especially in the beginning, looked at this operation car wash, like it was a very positive thing. It really did seem like, and and it probably was at the beginning motivated by a genuine desire to, to finally end this impunity that political elites had enjoyed for so long. Yeah. Jay. You're right. I mean, here, here, and you talk about Brazil and the corruption that way reminds me of Lebanon a lot because I used to live in Lebanon for like four, four to six years. And that's basically the same the same type of uh, view the citizens of Lebanon have of their of their political landscape as well, which is funny because Brazil is like the number one immigrant place for Lebanese people. They go to they go to Brazil in in droves, which is <laughs> actually which is, no is joke. a funny well, connection. A good family friend, I have a good family friend, half Lebanese, half Brazilian. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, no. It, well, the 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 vice president um, of Dilma who was like this sleazy, you know, just Temer. kind of like machine politician, Michelle Temer. Yeah. Who, you know, nobody knew. And he was just vice president because PT needed the workers party needed the sleazy transactional parties to form the coalition. And then he turned around and led the impeachment against her kind of a little palace coup. And yeah, there were a lot of people who were very confused. He looks like a vampire and he's Lebanese, hundred <laughs> percent Lebanese. And people were very confused. Wow. Like why is someone who's Lebanese, the president of Brazil, it makes no sense, but it's exactly what you just said. There is a big and influential Lebanese population. Right. Right. And um, to, to go back to the, to operation car wash and at the end of it, like what kind of impact did you see it have on Brazil after, after everything? Like what was the, the main fallout? Well, the problem, you know, it, this is, you know, I wrote the book in, in, in really for an international audience, not because I thought that people were dying to know about the details of, you know, Operation Car Wash, but because there's so many lessons to draw from wh what happened and, and also the way the journalism was kind of a corrective and also why Bolsonaro won. And I think sometimes we can learn lessons by looking at other countries and, and the, the lessons become clear because we don't have these preconceptions about them. Um, so, you know, I think that one of the things that happened was that Sergio Moro became such a gigantic figure with so much popular support that either every institution was petrified of him, including superior courts and the Supreme Court. They could not reverse his convictions, even when he was blatantly running roughshod over the constitutional rights of defendants or breaking the law because they were afraid of popular unrest. You know, the, 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 the religion of Brazil basically became, you know, Operation Car Wash is what we support. And anyone who gets in the way of it is going to be our enemy. So they were petrified of Sergio Moro. And the media, you know, the media is notoriously concentrated in the hands of two or three or four at the most very rich families with very homogenized politics. And they saw the opportunity to weaponize Operation Car Wash for political ends. And so they just started you know, kind of canonizing Sergio Moro. Every week you'd walk by a newsstand and his picture would be on the cover of a Newsweekly in very reverent terms. And the power that he ended up amassing was so enormous that he was infinitely more powerful than any elected official, even though he no one ever voted for him for anything. And he existed outside of the realm of democratic accountability. And so I would say that... Um, my dogs hate Sergio Moro, so if I <laughs> talk too much about him, they're gonna. Every you know? <laughs> yeah, they get very agitated. Um, so you know, they they you know, it got to the point where almost every major political event in Brazil, from say 2015 until 2019, up to the election of Bolsonaro, was driven by this anti-corruption narrative spun by Sergio Moro. One of the, the main things that they would do is. They would, you know, they also corrupted the Brazilian justice system. So it used to be that it was almost impossible to imprison people pending trial. 
people were entitled mm -hmm. to be free until they were proven guilty by the state. Only in very rare cases could you justify imprisoning somebody if they were likely to kill others. It was a very high bar. Mm -hmm. And they just put everybody in prison. You know, they took these like manicured, coddled sons of billionaires and put them in, you know, Brazilian prisons are not nice places to be. And they put them there and they said, hey, the only way you're ever going to get out of here is if you sign this confession accusing these other people of doing things, regardless of whether or not they did. And they would sign them and then they would get these you know, signed accusations. They're kind of like plea bargains, but they're just ways of getting leniency. And they would leak them at will to, you know, like Globo or whoever. So they had the power to destroy people's reputations. The media would just irresponsibly, kind of like the US media relationship with the CIA, they would just irresponsibly scream in headlines or on the lead story of the major television programs. You know, we got a big leak. This politician or this banker was accused of, and everybody believed it. They had the power to destroy everybody's reputation overnight. And so, you know, for me, one of the big lessons is that human beings can never be trusted with unlimited power. Once they start getting that power, even if you begin well-intentioned, you know, with a lot of integrity or noble ends, you, it will end up corrupting you. I mean, it's a, it's a cliche, but you can see yeah. it really vividly. Yeah. Lord Acton, uh, absolute power. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, but you know, in your book, you obviously, uh, focus on, this whole trove of leaks coming from one particular source, a hacker. Um, I mean, obviously we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of each and every single bit, but if what's the, what's the most abbreviated version of what you found in your reporting of this particular operation car wash and what you found between both judge Sergio Moro and the prosecutors of Operation Car Wash. Yeah, so there are some countries, you know, like Italy is one, Spain is another, where judges have this kind of mixed role where they're both the judge and the investigator or the prosecutor. But Brazil system is like the U.S., which is the prosecutors are over here on the left, the defendants over here on the right, and the judge is supposed to be in the middle, maintaining, you know, equal distance between the two parties having no conversations with either side without the other president, except in the rarest of circumstances, um, and being objective and neutral. That's the core guarantee of the justice system is if you're accused of a crime by the state, you know that you have the opportunity to go into a court and have a judge who has no interest in the outcome of the proceedings adjudicate fairly the evidence presented by each side. That's the central promise of a healthy functioning justice system. And one of the first things I saw when this hacker started uploading this enormous archive, I mean, it ended up being larger than the Snowden archive in terms of size. And the Snowden archive at the time was the largest leak in, you know, recent modern journalism history was I found the chats between Sergio Moro and the chief of the car wash prosecutorial team, Delton Delignol. And they were chatting like little teenagers over telegram all day long, every day for years. And not, you know, about, you know, like, recommending cat videos. They were plotting together constantly about how to construct the charges against each defendant to ensure that when Sergio Moro found them guilty, the, the verdict would be upheld on appeal. He would direct them what searches and seizures they should order the federal police to conduct. He was basically the chief of the prosecutorial team, not in any way judging them. And multiple times as part of their plotting, we found them breaking the law knowingly, you know, getting around legal obstacles that were in their way to what they want to what they wanted to accomplish, admitting that they were politically motivated, that they were desperate to, pre to prevent Lula from returning to power. All the things basically that they had spent years denying that people suspected, this archive demonstrated they in fact were doing. And the corruption was so grave that after the first week of the reporting, you know, when I had only published a tiny little fraction, an infinitesimal fraction of what I would end up publishing, his main media allies almost entirely abandoned him. Like one of the big center-right newspapers editorialized after I think the third or fourth day of the reporting that he should immediately resign. Was that um, Veja? Yeah, that was Estadal. Veja Estadal, is, okay. you know, like a, a center-right um, newsweekly. That was probably his biggest supporter outside of Globo. And I lured them into my evil web by uh, getting them to partner in the reporting. And so they actually, uh, when they you got that gang. We got, he says he's evil. 
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> That's going to be the Twitter clip. Um, <laughs> Habibis, to catch a full episode, go subscribe to us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Habibi Bros. Turn the link down below. Steve's mom. <laughs>